It's time for Twit, episode 261. Denise Howells here, Jeff Jarvis, and his son Jake are here. And we're going to talk about the Google Verizon deal. Is Google suddenly evil? Let's find out next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Winamp. Subscribe to Twit and all your favorite podcasts with the ultimate media player. Download it for free at winamp.com. Video bandwidth for Twit is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 261, recorded August 15th, 2010. Abandon all hope. This Week in Tech is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Improve your conference calls and keep everyone on the same page when you share your screen with GoToMeeting. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com slash twit. And by Ford and the new Ford Fiesta. With an EPA-estimated 40 miles per gallon highway, no other compact car is more fuel efficient. And fuel economy is just for starters. The 2011 Ford Fiesta. We invite you to drive one this week at a Ford dealer near you. And by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to submit your ideas and innovations, go to ecomagination.com slash challenge. And don't forget to mention Twin. It's time for Twit this week in Twit. <laughs> what is oh technology? And joining us, we're so glad to have a live all in studio cast today, starting with the star of This Week in Google, the author of What Would Google Do, and a professor of journalism at the City University of New York. You know by now I'm talking about Jeff Jarvis at Buzz Machine. Happy to finally be in Twit Cottage. It's, it's so nice it's, to it's have It's a wonderful you. place. It's great. It's beautiful. And you're out yeah. here uh, for a conference or? Uh, the PII 2010 conference in Seattle for. Privacy and stuff. Or? Post intelligence, sir. Uh, nope. Uh, uh, personally identifiable information is the joke. Oh, I like it. Yeah, I yes. like it. And you're of course writing a book called Public Parts, so that's yes. appropriate uh, for you. And uh, one of his most public uh, achievements is his son, Jake Jarvis, who is also <laughs> yeah. in the studio with us. In yeah. fact, this is uh, your last appearance before you enter college. That's right. Yep. How exciting! I know. Where are you going? Could you? I don't know if you want to reveal it or not. I mean, Jake, is Jake as public as you are, Jeff? No one's as public as I am. But, uh, <laughs> he has to bear with me. Uh, University of Rochester. Congratulations. Thank you. How exciting. When do you matriculate? Uh, 25th. We go up there and classes start about a week later. How exciting. Yeah. How fun. Are you, are you nervous? Or are you... A little bit. Yeah. Ready, though. We dropped my daughter off. Uh, her freshman year has already started on Saturday, and we were yeah. bawling our eyes out. Jeffrey, you, you going once, What's one brief, <laughs> one brief happy email. I know she's happy. Oh, that's, she's that's, still unpacking. That's all I care about. Well, she wouldn't let us unpack for her. So yeah, you're probably right. She probably she probably hasn't unpacked. That's Denise Howell, who is also a mom, but her son is only six and a half. So you got a few years left. Yeah, goes by fast though, doesn't it? Does, it? does. Yeah. faster than you may save up now? Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Denise is a uh, an attorney. She is our host uh, at of this week in law. A great show on the Google on the Google Network. <laughs> if only on the <laughs> on the Twit Network, um, which uh, you do that every Friday. Could yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not for sale. They're evil. We're talking about that in a second. Denise uh, also is a blogger at bagandbaggage.com and writes the uh, logarithms blog for ZDNet. Nice to see you. Great to be here. And you're here for family. Here for family. Just taking a and week And to off. see the animals at Safari yes, West. Safari West just up the road. That's really fun. We brought the kids there every year. It was so it's much great. fun. They have like wild, wild animals. Wild animal park. Yeah. Did you know there's a wild animal no. park in Petaluma? <laughs> it's just chickens and cows, but it's really great. <laughs> it's really great. So thanks to everybody for being in studio with us. We have quite a large in-studio audience of people from all over the country and the world visiting. And, of course, everybody at home who's watching at live.twit.tv. We watch the chat room as the show goes by. And if you have thoughts or questions, you're always welcome to contribute them. I'll be glad to ignore them at irc.twit.tv. TV. This is episode 261, so our stories are online at delicious.com slash twit slash 261. And I guess we have to talk about really the biggest story of the week. There's actually 
Now, some additional stuff around it. Oracle suing Google. Google does a deal with Verizon. There was a great tweet. A guy named, I think, Phil Nash posted a tweet, which I retweeted, and I think I'm getting credit for it. And I, I really shouldn't get credit for it because it wasn't uh, my idea, but I did retweet him. And uh, unfortunately, the way retweeting seems to work on Twitter, sometimes you get, you get credit uh, for stuff that you post, even though you're just you retweeting. Lose the provenance. The provenance got, got so I want to make I want to say his name, and uh, I'm going to read his tweet, which I really liked. If I could find it here, of course it's been retweeted a bunch. So, uh, welcome to the new decade, said Phil Nash. Java is a restricted platform. Mm. Google is evil. Apple is a monopoly, and Microsoft are the underdogs. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is true, isn't it? Yeah, we were thinking on uh, this week in Google when we talked about the Google Verizon uh, deal that maybe Bing was the you know the place to go to hide from Google. So let's let's start with this Google Verizon thing. First of all, I, I, maybe I should ask Denise. Google said this isn't an agreement. This is just a proposal for legislation. What's the story? Right, and and I think it's it's even more removed than that. It's sort of it, and. It's not know. an operating agreement. It's not something no. they've agreed to do together. No, no, no. They got together and they decided. And and uh, kudos to Google for actually taking a stand on an issue and taking it to Washington, which is something that people complain about a lot, that there are technology companies that are involved in issues that touch all of our lives every day, and their users certainly care a lot about these issues, but sometimes they just let those issues go by and don't do any lobbying um so i think of this as kind of like a lobbying effort they got together they put together a policy statement and uh they took it to washington it's it's a little bit like writing a letter to your congressman well it's also only. stepping into a into a policy vacuum i think yes which is what uh susan crawford has said in her blog and in a guest post i think for giga home that mm -hmm. the fcc should grow a pair mm -hmm. and uh step into this and the problem is that they haven't and that's why google and verizon kind of step out and say oh the world should look like this yes the sad part is, why the hell Google made this deal? I, I, I still just baffles me. Well, Google was uh, one of those companies that says we'll never work with Verizon. We don't believe in limiting your your you know internet access. We don't believe that companies like uh, Verizon who want to do things well. Remember the Wired magazine article where AT and T went to Apple saying, "Could you please uh, limit those YouTube videos to ten seconds because it's killing our network?" <laughs> Uh, you would think Google would be the first one to say that's a bad idea. Well, and Google, who says customer first? In nothing in this is thinking like us. What we want, and Google should want, because it is aligned with our interests, is a hugely open, free internet wherever you get it. And to limit that, uh, I wrote a post on Buzz Machine about internet schminternet, and we have the internet now, and then the schminternet is where everything good is going to happen. And that's going to cost more money, and that's going to be limited, and that's going to be censored by phone companies. And that's no good, and that's why everyone is so distressed that Google would go along with us. Well, the Nexus was their attempt to open this, and then they got rid of it because of the phone companies. So they were going there, and then they suddenly started backpedaling. 2006. Okay. This is Google's public service announcement. If I had to make a better internet. If I had to make a better internet. If I had to make a better internet, I'd make it smaller. I don't trust these kids and their crazy startup ideas. I don't trust these kids with their crazy startup ideas. Look. I can't deal with all these web pages. Enough with all these internet videos. If I want to watch a movie, I'll just go to the movies. What the internet needs? More restrictions. More restrictions. More restrictions. Why should I be able to surf wherever I want? Who needs a gazillion sites? Can someone please just block my favorite sites? I don't care what music I listen to. I want someone to choose for me. I want someone to choose it for me. Let's leave the internet with the big corporations where it belongs. Then it says, the new internet. If AT&T <laughs> and Verizon have their way. This well, is an ad did. that Google made. Save the internet, support net neutrality. I think, isn't, isn't Jake right that this is about Android, this is about phones? Google's now in the phone business. Is it greed? That's what I was thinking. What, what's in it for them? What's in it for them? Well, Google says, and you know, we will get, I, I apologize to all my friends at Google, 
including Chris Bono, who did send us an email well, saying, I'd love ask, to come on and talk. We did uh -huh. ask Google Public Relations to, to come on uh, this week. And we will get somebody on this week in Google on Wednesday, and maybe it'll be Chris Bono. So I, I will give Google a chance to say. But they, in their blog this week, they responded to all the criticism saying, well, it was the best we could do. It was the best we could get. We had to get something. So we said, okay, we'll protect the landline internet with net neutrality. And that's, in fact, what this agreement says. Oh, okay, landlines, no problem. Net neutrality rules. But if you're wireless, you could do whatever you want. Because it's so much harder on wireless to do good internet. So is this true? Is this the all that Google could get? Did they get a concession why, why that's of value? Why put themselves in the position that they think it's up to them to negotiate this? When China came along, they said, oh, no, no, we're not a country. We don't really want to be in this position. And now they set themselves up to negotiate with Verizon and not on our interest. That, it, I mean, so does this, it doesn't have any impact uh, of law. It's not an operating agreement. It's not a business agreement with Verizon. It's just two companies who are hereditary enemies getting together and saying to Congress, this is what you should do. But doesn't that have a lot of weight, especially if it's Google and, you know, two enemies saying this? It's very educational, I think, for the people in Washington. In a lot of instances, this is going to be their talking points, their bullets on well, that's how all scary. this works. Yeah, that is a little bit scary. Their reaction is going to be what any, uh, you know, ignorant normal person would say, oh, well, it's Google and Verizon. It must be the way it should be. Right. Oi. Oi. <laughs> right. And, you know, I mean, there needs to be some definition and texture around what the Internet becomes next. Because the world where we all had a desktop and a landline has gone away. Right. And the know. internet is wireless in many, right. for many of us. That'll be entirely wireless, uh, including you know Google itself fought for white spaces uh, to become Wi-Fi on steroids, and that would give us what we really need, which is competition. Uh, for Google to say that there is competition in wireless is just ridiculous. We don't have competition. They were stuck with. 2.2 bad choices. Right. So what should we, uh, as consumers, what should we fight for at this point? Should we say, I mean, obviously the answer to this is simple. Just write to your member of Congress and say, well, that's Google and Verizon, but we don't agree. As users of the Internet, the Internet should, I always, I hate the phrase net neutrality. I think that confuses people. I would say uh, anti-discrimination because that's really what we're saying is that, no, that a bit is a bit. No bit on the internet should be treated differently than any other open, bit. Open, competitive, capitalistic internet. I see. I like that because Congress likes that open, capitalistic, competitive. That's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. You're saying a free market on the yes, internet. Yes, a free market internet. Yeah, yeah. See, that's good. Congress likes free market. That's a safe thing to say. I think we need you to organize the constitutional convention of the internet. Well, well this is the irony. That PSA that I ran, that public service announcement, was for a site called savetheinternet.org. That's right. Yep. And Google got behind it. And the whole idea of savetheinternet.org was to fight these, uh, you know, anti-open initiatives. People like Verizon and Comcast who were saying, well... You know, uh, the Internet's okay as long as you don't use Skype or uh, BitTorrent on it. <laughs> we, you better not try that. I really, I, I, so, so Jake, are you saying that it's greed, basically, that now, they're, they're, now that they are effectively in bed with Verizon uh, uh, over Android phones and, and every other cell phone company, that they now their, their interests coincide with the wireless company's interests? Well, I, I guess it's just I don't understand why they feel the need to step in and be the big bully about this. It's, I, I don't think the backfire is worth it for them. Well, they certainly get in a lot, a lot of backlash. Right. right. Uh, that's 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 clear. I, do I you think that they, they underestimated that, uh, Jeff what the what the response would be, or do they even care? God, that that is scare me if they don't care. Uh, do they need they, to care? Why they, do they, they need they've to cared care? in the past? They've you know well, but you know look at it this way. We we give a lot of crap to Facebook, but Facebook uh, is more responsive to Ironically. the fits people have exactly. Uh, than, than Google thinks they need to be. Uh, I, I just don't understand what they get out of it. It's not, you know, it, I'm flummoxed. I'm absolutely flummoxed. This was, I, I we, we, you, Gina, and I tried to understand it as well on This Week in Google, and they, that was the Why Google Why should have been the title That's of that show. David Weinberger mm -hmm. wrote a wonderful post uh, talking about how he is the Google fanboy. He loves everything Google has. He uses every product, and we just don't understand. And the response that Google gave didn't help. No. At all. No. It sounded like they were, um, what was the phrase they used in Wired magazine? Uh, uh, well, it's like arguing with my German in-laws. I've learned how to argue with Germans, which is that you, they just repeat themselves and say it over and over and over <laughs> again until you'll finally say yes. 
And that's what it was. It was just repeating the same points with more space. But it the really wire called them carrier humping net neutrality surrender monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that kind of says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, all right. I, I had uh, uh, Jake and I had uh, breakfast with Ohm Malik uh, this week. What did Ohm think? Ohm is making arguments that Google is kind of on the way down, and I hear that all the time. You know, yin 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 Jarvis. He says Google's on the way down. Yeah, and, I, and 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 people try to say it to me that uh, yeah, your book. You know, look at what would Google do? Ha ha. I still believe in Google. I'm with Weinberger on this. I still think that they're the smartest company around. I still think they get it. Well, he was talking about how he was talking about his phone and how he uses apps to go directly to Yelp and everything instead of Googling like restaurant reviews. Right. So, so in that sense, searches. searches I would say down. I would agree. Searches on the way. Right. Yeah. Right. Not way down, but it's but it's not the be all and end all. There's other ways of getting stuff. I think the app, th to me, the app ecosystem is actually a negative. I think so. Too. I mean, we've talked about this, Jeff, on this week in Google. It's it's, it's uh, organizing. It's a Virginia Heffernan's uh, uh, phrase in the New York Times. It's the, it's the suburbs yeah. of the Internet where you go. It's safe. It's protected. People uh, use iPhones like apps because they want that kind of perfect experience, but it's not the real Internet. Yeah, I'm almost saying, as I remember, Jake, that, that it wasn't just search. It was also that that ad model then starts to go away. When, when you have the closed app world, the more attention right. it grabs. Yeah, Yelp's got, and Yelp and Facebook, because they have location information tied with social graph, right. that's more valuable, really, than this the plain search index. Although, it's nice to have the search index, too. Oh, I, one of my experiences, I've started doing, trying check-ins on Yelp. You know, I was using Foursquare. I still use Foursquare, all these different. Yelp has Foursquare-style check-ins. But Yelp doesn't have a huge database of businesses that's where the search piece is kind of missing, right? And I imagine they're they're using something like Google's database of uh, businesses. So you do need search in conjunction with all of this stuff. People aren't going to Google. I think that's what he's trying to say. Yeah, they're not. Well, Denise, well, are you going to Google less? less? Going. Uh, I'm not going less, but um, I think maybe my son is. Hmm. This, this Tyler uses Google. What we're yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not unfettered. But at, I guess what I'm getting at is. Uh, all of this is scaring me as a parent, that the internet that, that he's growing up with looks far different than the one that I knew. This is how hip you are. Because a normal parent would say, oh, this is much safer. There's no porn. There's, you know, Steve Jobs, our Thank phones you, have Steve no Jobs. smut. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what a, that's what a well, less hip parent would say. But what you're saying is I want an open internet for my Child. I don't know if I'm saying that, actually, but thank you for crediting me with that degree of hipness. You know, we just sent him off in the car with his iPad, which I'm perfectly happy to let him play around on it. Well, even though, you know, he could go to Safari and... You have to work hard to get porn on the iPad. Exactly. Trust me, I've done it. I mean, uh, I mean only for research. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's good babysitting for so three why and a half would, hours. But why do you think that it's bad for Tyler if Google makes a deal with Verizon? Well, I mean, I, I don't want him to grow up in a world where he lives only on apps and data is being harvested from him right and left, right. and maybe he doesn't know it and how, he doesn't how know will, how to deal with that How situation. soon will you let him have a Facebook page? Um, well, I certainly would abide by the company's terms of service, and I'm not <laughs> sure what the speaking, youngest... Speaking as an attorney, I would say yes. 13, she Copa, says. Copa. High school, yes. Um, no, it's 13. It's 13 because of Copa. to do yeah. it when he was 13, I'd be behind that. I let my as, kids do yeah. it younger. Jake, um, how old were you when you got on the... Well, I, could, I got on as soon as I could when yeah. I opened it up, so I was... You were younger, Grandpa probably. Jake here, you know, he's right been around. freshman year. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you were the right age, but if you could have gotten in earlier, oh, yeah, and Jake is a develop. You've developed stuff for Facebook. Yeah. You've you've worked with FBML and all of that stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, MySpace was the big thing back then. Right. And Zynga, and everyone was on that, so I'm sure it would have been the same thing. With right. Facebook. Right. Right. I, mean, I don't think Google's going down. Let me get that on the on the record. I think that this is a warning shot to Google that says, "Watch out." Warning we've, shot from its users. We've we're you want you want to know evil? We just defined evil. We did it. <laughs> we did it. We did it. We told you what evil is. Now, you can, you know, we're like God here. We'll full, we'll forgive you. We will forgive you. You're saying we, the consumers, we, the consumers your users. We, we have grace, and we will forgive you, Google, but you better understand the errors of your ways here. That's my view. But then is that just us geeky nuts and nobody else cares? Yeah. Well, I wonder, and I think probably that's the calculus that Google and Verizon have made. It's certainly the calculus that Comcast, Verizon... AT and T are always making. Eh, we can we can shut down these BitTorrent guys because that's just a small fraction. So geeks never really liked Microsoft until Scoble made them cuddly, uh, <laughs> and so it never really hurt them. 
And was he that, did. Is that where this heads? Didn't it? Maybe did it, it didn't. Him? I don't know. I guess you're right. It didn't. You're absolutely right. It didn't hurt Microsoft. So would it hurt Google if geeks don't like them anymore? I, I would think like so, it. because think geeks so. don't have to like a company for it to be successful in the enterprise, which Microsoft has always traditionally been. And geeks are never going to use Bing. Mm -hmm. Well, Google's made of geeks. That's all their products are. <laughs> it's made of geeks. <laughs> they all have such bad UI because it's geeks making them. Show name. Soylent Red. <laughs> <laughs> Soylent Red. It's made of geeks. <laughs> Well, you know, it's we really. I, I almost feel like we, on this week in Google, we we talked this this subject out. I, I, we had to bring it up on this week in no. tech because we hadn't talked about it. It happened between the last show and this show. Um, but it, I think you and I and everybody else are having the same reaction, which is, why Google? Why shaking our heads? And uh, I don't know. We're angry at Google, but we still love Google, don't we? We we not we're not nobody's willing to give up on Google I yet. Absolutely agree with that. Yep, no, no reason to yet. No. No reason to yet? Uh, hasn't changed day to day how Google operates, so. I wonder how much dissent inside Google there is over oh, all this. That's what team. I was going to say. If the Chris DeBonos of the world start to rear up and say, I'm sorry, this is not working for me anymore, then, then Google's got a problem. That's a good point. I was thinking we probably should have had Kevin Marks on last week since he's out of Google but has Google friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He might have uh I will contact Kevin and Chris for this week in Google on Wednesday. Yeah. We should get we should get them on. I'd be very curious what they have to say about this. Mm -hmm. Um It was it felt like a week where uh we lost our innocence a little bit mm -hmm. about Google. I'm going there tomorrow. Are you? Yeah. Um I'm going to uh Jake and I are going to tour. Uh, of the promised land, and then um, I'm having lunch with Google News folks and then a couple of the meetings. I, I hope end. you'll ask around. I'll be with oh, I'll be with the PR people, so you know, who are going to try to get someone on last show. So I'll ask. Oh, Karen, them yeah, the Karen, yeah, and and well, see what they say. Well, I think this is something. This is true of Microsoft, although nobody ever really wanted to admit it. But all of these big companies, when you have tens of thousands of employees, there's a huge diversity of opinion within the company. There's no unified point of view, and I think it's pretty clear. In at least in the China situation, that Eric Schmidt had one point of view, and Larry and Sergey, the founders, had another point of yes. view. And and Eric won briefly. The founders eventually won. I don't know if there's that same kind of division up at the top this time. There might be. What I wonder is whether the employees were talking about this on Buzz. I didn't see anything. I didn't either. I followed Buzz carefully. Yeah. As you know, I'm the only one. <laughs> well, they tried hard to couch this, speaking of speaking with the PR people, as something that was not far down on the evil spectrum at all. In fact, something that is good and healthy for But as Leo said, it was this kind of, well, this is this is the best we could get. Mm -hmm. This is this is compromise. And, uh, right. I don't know yeah. so, had a compromise. Devil's in the details. Am, am I being yeah. a drama queen about all this? Lennon 2010 says, you did the same thing with Facebook. All the hyperbole and the drama. Am I being a drama queen? Is this not a big deal? I mean, I'm willing. You can tell me the truth. I think we learned that uh, it certainly gets a lot of attention when a couple of Fortune 500 or 100 companies get together and make a policy statement like this, even though it has no force of law. Um, it's going it's to scary be to me. paid attention to. Yeah, yeah. And it could be influential and sway people's opinions in Washington. And A separate then it gets, internet is a yeah. big deal. It's a bad yeah. thing. Period. And that's what they're saying. Actually, a two- or three-tiered internet. It's yes. not even just a two-tiered internet. You have the the open internet, the, the wireless internet, which is very closed, and then you have this kind of pay-per-view internet. It's the Inception internet. Mm -hmm. Inception? Oh, it's like the Three movie. Dreams? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jake took me through the last All right, well, so let I me give you the it, kick. Yeah. <laughs> you ready for your kick? We're going we're gonna to take a break, come back with more. We've got a great cast of, of characters here. Jeff Jarvis from uh, buzzmachine.com. His son, Jake Jarvis uh, from jakejarvis.com. And Denise Howell from bagandbaggage.com. And we have much more to talk about. Google's being sued. Now Google's going to be the bad, the good guy mm -hmm. and the bad guy. We got an even worse villain in the in the scene here. <laughs> 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 only only Larry Ellison could be a worse villain in this uh, situation. Before we do though, I want to say hello to the folks at Ford and thank them for bringing us out to the uh, Ford plant. We had so much fun watching those F150 trucks being built. I hope you saw the uh, specials that we made from the Ford plant, three of them and then one from Maker Fair Detroit which was amazing. That's all on the Twit specials feed. This episode is brought to you by the all-new 2011 Ford Fiesta. That's Yeah, that's the car I crashed into. By the way, not a scratch. <laughs> I drove a flex into a Fiesta. You didn't see that, did you? 
Yeah. Anyway, my fault. They wanted me to tell you that it works fine. It was just Leo that doesn't. <laughs> and not a scratch on it. The Fiesta is really cool. The new 2011. I drove it the other day. It's the most fuel-efficient compact car on the road today. It's a gas vehicle with, get this, an EPA-estimated 40 miles per gallon highway. That means it can go from L.A. to San Francisco in a single tank of gas. You could have driven up here. How many tanks of gas did you use? It took me two, and my Porsche's parked on the oh, curve outside. Me. No, no, it's a, it's a Cayenne. It's an older one. And I'm telling you, my next car, which is going to be real, real soon now, when they update Sync the next time, it's going to be a Ford. Good for you, Denise. Yeah. Sync won me over. I love mm -hmm. the Sync and the Ford. So how does the Fiesta compare? More miles per gallon highway than the Yaris from Toyota. Uh, over the Honda Civic, you'll save up to $182 a year in gas. And, of course, it's a great ride. They're really, you know, you, you put your foot on the pedal. It's very responsive, very energized. That's because it has that Duratec 1.6 liter uh, I-4 engine in it, a front strut McPherson suspension. That might even rival your Porsche there. It's front <laughs> sway bar. 22 millimeter sway bar and twist beam rear suspension give it a, a very nice ride very snappy punchy it, it this thing feels great you don't feel like you're getting 40 miles to the gallon let me put it that way mm -hmm. best in class fuel efficiency great performance a good looking interior and exterior design you want to see for yourself yeah it's really kind of something special try a ford fiesta the 2011s are just out this week at a ford dealer near you drive one we think you'll like it this week in Technology is a, is a Google show, is an Oracle show, is a Microsoft show, is an Apple show. All of those companies, the big names in technology, Facebook, too, in the news. Let's talk about the Oracle thing. Is Oracle suing Google over Android? We've got, we got a lawyer in here. Thank God, Denise Howell. Um, it's not often you say that. <laughs> Sorry. Thank God there's a lawyer in the room. Yes. I, know. I don't hear I know, that very no. often. You know, that's what Shakespeare said. First, let's call a lawyer. Um, the, uh, the folks at... <laughs> typo. <laughs> typo. <laughs> Wrong. Uh, the folks at Sun put up with the fact that Google rewrote the Java virtual machine. They call it Dalvik. Um, and made Android based on Dalvik, the Java uh, virtual machine. Um, I guess it is technically a violation of the uh, the rules of engagement uh, in um, I'm not an expert on this, but in the, in the Java. But Sun knew it and said, eh, maybe because Sun was a lot smaller than Google. Oracle buys Sun, and one of the first things they do is they sue Google, saying you're violating our intellectual property. Uh, this one's going to go on for years, isn't it? I think so. Yes. This is not a quick and easy, especially since Google has come out saying what they have said, which is. Not only is this a baseless lawsuit, but it threatens the entire infrastructure of open source licensing. Does it really? That's what they are contending, yes. Well, one of the I things mean, that puzzled me statement. is that uh, Android and uh, Dalvik is licensed under the Apache license, and, and Sun is GPL, and they, which seem, on the face of it, seem incompatible. I know this is real arcana, and I don't expect you to respond uh, in any w intelligible way to it but it just that's it's, a good thing <laughs> not a patent lawyer <laughs> i know it's 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 insanely complicated um it, it also seems a little bit hostile but not that larry ellison has ever been uh, anything but aggressive in his business right. practices um there's a great article which i i have put in our show notes uh from uh, tico systems on uh, on this lawsuit let me see if i can kind of summarize here it's not Oracle versus Google, why, is uh, the question mark. This is a redmonk.com. When Android debuted, debuted in uh, 2006, I couldn't figure out how Google had managed to apply an Apache license to the project. This is, as I mentioned, it was a GPL license project. Google wasn't using Sun's virtual machine. They built their own, as Danger did before it. And, of course, the Google Android is based kind of on Danger. Um, Google said it's a clean room implementation. We've seen this before. This is how the whole BIOS wars back in the early days of the PC, the PC clones uh, were based on the IBM PC, but they did it in a, in a clean room. What does that mean when they say clean room environment? I think of where they fab chips when people <laughs> say that. <laughs> it's basically, they're reverse en I think they're reverse engineering it. Is yeah. the they idea. code yeah. from scratch. Right. They cannot look at the code. They cannot try to disassemble the code. They have to merely emulate you're the programmer in here uh, jake they merely emulate what the code does without actually re you know looking at it um what 
he says in this blog post is it's not clear why Google re-implemented the JVM, uh, but they knew it was risky. Google, it's, he says, could have reasonably assumed that the probability of Sun suing them was near zero. Mm -hmm. That's so th this that's is safe. the hazard of any open source based product. Is this a problem for open source in general? It is a problem for open source in general because there are always murky issues about what has gone into the mix. We do see constant mm -hmm. lawsuits over all open source software. Right. Because you can take two from column A and one from column right. B and some of them may be licensed one way and some may be not licensed at Whatever all. Whatever happened to the famous, infamous uh, open source troll company? I'm forgetting the name of them. That went after again and again and again and oh. they were going to be a threat to the whole the SCO, world. The SCO thing? Yeah. 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 It's over. Yeah. SCO's yeah. over. Mm -hmm. only, it only took Sco's them 25 over. years practically. Yeah. But it just recently this the whole SCO thing went away. Right. Because they, they claimed that... Uh, for years and years. Great blog called Grok Law. Right. Followed it all very, right. very closely. Um, huge cost, right, Denise? Yeah, huge, huge cost. But mostly it cost to SCO because SCO lost big time on this. Mm -hmm. And Linux was... And Unix... You know, SCO bought the Unix name, basically. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's Unix and you're stealing Unix code. And they had, there was no merit. Although, remember that uh, Microsoft also owns some of this stuff and has, in fact, licensed... Remember they indemnified people who use... Um, what was the deal? They indemnified people who use Microsoft products or Linux. I can't remember the deal. They made a deal with uh, mm -hmm. with Linux over that and said, "Okay, if you pay our license, well, we'll pr we'll protect you." Right, and Linux Linux actually has provisions in its documentation where every time you alter the kernel, contribute to the kernel, and it gets accepted, you're supposedly indemnifying right. that you are the original intellectual property That's the, creator problem. there. Yes. You've got a million developers. You right. can't always be sure that it's clean. Right, right. So, and the GPL people have been fighting along the way to update the license, which happened not too long ago. I guess the current version has provisions that would deal with this situation, the that would the, the the in this in this blog post he says really the issue is you're you're going to damage the sun jo java ecosystem by this lawsuit you're gonna make it very unlikely that people will look at java and say oh we should do we should use java but on the other hand the benefit you might make some money they spent what something like six billion dollars six and a half billion dollars for sun mm -hmm. so so he's saying well basically they're trying to get back their money even though in their financial justifications, even though there'll be ecosystem long-term damage to the ecosystem for a short-term cash Someone in, windfall. In the chat room said to you, Leo, that uh, Wired is saying, you know, this is the end of, of Java. It could be. Who would take a chance yeah. with with you know, knowing Oracle? You're not gonna you're not gonna mess with it. And I think this was one of the concerns when when Oracle bought Sun. People were a little afraid of what's going to happen to so Java. Is this part of the movement to end software patents? I mean, is it, is oh, it's man, hopeless? That's, that's something I'd love to see, but that doesn't, is that, how likely is that? Um, not very likely in the wake of the Supreme Court's recent statement on that front. That what do they say? Software patents still survive. Uh, they're not going to be ruled out as they have been in other countries, such as the EU, and I believe Australia has a similar piece of legislation pending. Um, where they're just going to say that category of item is just not going to be unique enough, um, have that whiz-bang factor that leads something to be able to be patented. They're going to say, we're, you can take this on a case-by-case -case basis, and we're going to let the Patent and Trademark Office work it out, which so if that we know happens, they haven't been doing too fabulous a job on that. Right. Um, I saw Beth Novick this week, uh, interview of my book on, on, on the peer-to-patent movement, but mm -hmm. she's done some really neat work on that. Mm -hmm. And the patent office is a mess. So if you had Europe um, patent-free on software, you're still stuck with the lowest common denominator, aren't you? You're still stuck with America. Right. You are. So it does you no good. <laughs> nice to know we're the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Right. So um, um, Miguel de Acaza uh, has also uh, blogged a little bit on this. He's uh, the guy who did uh, Gnome, and um, mm -hmm. um, oh, he's, he's currently doing an open source uh, mono, the open source version of uh, .NET. And uh, he thinks it's just, he thinks there's a good chance that, that Google will just give him some billions of dollars and go away. And then Oracle goes one by one through all the OEMs. Google gives them money for the Google implementation of Android, and then it's on to HTC and 
Motorola and one by one. Did Steve Jobs and, and Larry Ellison have coffee recently? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, because it sure is uh, something that Steve would love to see happen. Um, they did not. They did not. The Open Handset Alliance and Google did not license Sun before they made the Delphic. And I guess that's the issue. And perhaps it was something that Jonathan Schwartz knew when he was shopping the company that maybe he told Larry Ellison, hey, by the way, you know, you, you could always get some of this money back mm -hmm. by showing Google. Anyway, it's a bad thing. At the same time as they did that, I guess they thought, well, everybody be paying attention to that. Maybe we'll also announce that we're going to stop Open Solaris. Uh, and that's another bad move from Oracle for the open source movement. This is a really great open source operating system. All I can say is I wouldn't want to be the lawyer at Google who had blessed Android from the legal standpoint. Well, that's a good point. I think they knew. I don't think any lawyer would say, oh, no, you know, you don't have to license that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was a calculus. I'm sure the lawyer said, no, you, dudes, you know, you're, 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 you're really exposed here. Mm -hmm. And the calculus was, well, son, what are they going to do Explain about it? Explain it to me, though, now, if you could magically rewrite Android again. Do you lower your liability? No, you license it. Yeah, you license you it, do. or you get in. So it's all negotiation now. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no alternative to negotiation. They can't go back now. They can't start over. Right. They've already done it. What's done is done. They got it. They, they're gonna. They're either gonna give them a packet of money, or they're gonna say, "Come and get me," and it'll go on for years. But the that's risky, isn't it? It's risky. Could a judge issue an injunction saying you can't sell this anymore? Absolutely, and and Oracle will probably seek that kind of relief. Like Tebow. Right. It's, you know, we're at the very beginning stages of this year. So I got another see. great legal conundrum for the great legal minds. <laughs> mind. <listening> to, <laughs> mind. <laughs> There's one mind in the rest of us. <laughs> Denise Owl. This is a very interesting story from Facebook. A, a New Jersey town has started posting photos on Facebook of people they arrest for DUIs. It's the Evesham Police Department. Uh... The mugshot of a suspected auto thief was who was apprehended in Evesham was posted on its Facebook page. Then they started posting DUIs. Now, the, as far as I can tell, these are not <laughs> these are not people convicted of a crime. Yeah, this is really disturbing. I'm hoping the ACLU is paying some attention and perhaps going to go in and challenge this practice because, you know, these people have Look privacy rights. I don't know that you uh, give up your privacy rights simply by being accused of a crime but isn't that all public record in europe you couldn't do this mm -hmm. it's against the law there but here the police blotter is a public record not the pictures well but but no yeah i mean really? I'm, I'm a reporter yeah, mm -hmm. yeah i'm a reporter so, i used to be a reporter i, I won't show the full thing but here yeah. here's the facebook post on august 4th the evesham police department located and arrested a male being sought by the lower providence township pa police department and they're looking for who this guy is they're saying tag him. <laughs> <laughs> so far, they haven't. Ta nobody's tagged him. Oh, so it's him. America's most wanted. Yeah, it's America's most drunk. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Oh, okay. We had a story like this on Twill, where someone was riding the subway in Boston and uh, engaging in some not safe for anywhere sorts of activities, and another uh, another passenger got angry and and posted a picture to Twitter, and did you know said. Didn't know who this person was, but wanted to see if they could apprehend him. And sure enough, they did. So is it legal to do that? Sure, you can it's take a picture place. of a person in a public place. It's public place. That's Especially if they're breaking the law in some way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was a private individual doing it, though. Yes, yeah. that was private. Is individual. it different if a police department does I, it? I think it is. I, mean, I think there's the presumption, if I see this, that the guy is guilty of a crime. And isn't that exactly what you're not supposed to be? Right. You're not. You're and innocent to prove it. Given that the police blotter may be public. Yes. And uh, it, I just think, you know, you have that information there, but you're not. Once you start having a police department posting it on the Internet. But I, but I think, well, but hold on. Hold on, Counselor. Yeah. Um, you, by the way, Jeff and Dana Boyd had this debate. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Last month. And, and Carolyn McCarthy and CNET's saying that, in fact, this exact issue was debated uh, yeah, last exactly. month. Exactly. I, I think that we have to be more public. And, and yes, there's an issue that you're innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. Amen. Constitution, we like that. But... Yes, we do. Um, <laughs> I particularly enjoy uh, yes. that. <laughs> but uh, it happens all the time now in, in a high-profile case. So who's to say where the line is between high-profile and low-profile? What freaks us out here is this could be any of us. Right. Right? And these are not serial murderers going off and doing things. These are just plain old people, but it's still... 
there are people in the public record who are accused of a crime, and that right now, unless it's, correct me if I'm wrong, unless it's quashed in some way, that's open. Well, it's in newspapers all the time, isn't it? Yeah, is this, yeah. So my question is, it doesn't look like it's, uh, in some cases, for instance, here's uh, on August 12th, 2010, police responded, responded to the Walmart store. Uh, two shoplifting suspects chased on foot. They were hiding in a neighborhood. Here's their picture, their age, their city. Is this punitive? Is this, they're not asking for information, but these people have not been convicted oh, of a punitive, crime. Yeah. But they're being punished without due process. Yeah, that's what's disturbing about this to me. Is that it's one thing, you know, a newspaper oh, look, has... And look, at, look at the disclaimer. All persons on this page are innocent until proven guilty oh, in a nice. court of law. Like that gets them off the hook. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a voice from Dragnet. Yeah. Hey, we, oh, Your Honor, we posted it on our Facebook wall. It was our status post. For crying out loud. Look at all these. Look at all these perps on here. And by yeah. the way, I am not a Facebook member and I'm not logged in. So this is not just for Facebook. That's right. true. This is public information. But, but Denise, if, if, if one of those people were accused of murder, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be raising our eyebrows so much, right? Because yes, that's I would. Do. I, I would, yeah. Because but don't it, you I mean, say the police are seeking in... Joe Schmo and here's his picture and here's what he looks like? You're putting in, though, the extrapolation here is that journalists have access to that information. That doesn't mean that the rest of us Ah, do. but we're all journalists. Yeah, well, though. Well, also, though, there's this tradition of saying allegedly was is accused of mm -hmm. they're looking yes. for somebody in conjunction with an investigation of an well, event. But we they never that. say something like this. Because, Leo, Patricia Figueroa, age 45, was arrested for shoplifting from the Kohl's store. Here's her picture. But, Leo, here's what we do in journalism. We quote the police saying that, so this is just the police saying it. This cuts out the middleman, the mediator, or media. Mm -hmm. Everybody has access and to it, police And it takes now. the police and puts them into the role of the journalist. Yep, yep. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not that's disagreeing where I have that a I'm worried about situation. it, but I don't see the legal issue with it today. So and what side were you, today, were you arguing this with Dana? And Dana was saying, what was Dana's argument? Well, Dana was basically saying she was on the good side. Uh, <laughs> we mean my side? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, saying watch out. And especially this is going to hit certain uh, groups of people worse than others. Yes. And it will be used well, badly. And I agree with all those concerns. I'd like to point that out that there's mostly people of color on yeah, this page. Yeah. But right now, the way the law stands today, the police blotter is open to the public. And the public is not synonymous with journalists. The public is the public. And especially now that I could go and start a town blog in this an town and do this, I have all this access. I do think it's interesting. I it's think a there's fascinating you know, it something is. to talk about on the legal standpoint. I, I want to hear this on Twill. It's not a slam duck. Yeah. So it's not, it's not clear cut. No. It strikes me as by posting it there, and it's, it's it, you know, as a normal person reading this, you, they're not saying accused of or was in the was an investigation of. They're saying, we arrested these two for doing right, this. Because we're used to the language of the journalist as mediator between this and the police. Mm -hmm. This is the language of police. The perpetrator, they're saying the perpetrator did this, did that. They don't say allegedly. They say we're charging this person with this. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's the way they right. talk. Oh, so it's all the journalists who are saying it's accused, the journalists uh, who add in the alleged. It, well, it's the journalists because the journalists are covering their rears ah. in this. And they, they attribute it to the they police. They do use the word suspect here. They don't use the word bad guy. I mean, <laughs> I don't, does that let them off the hook? I don't know. Right. Right. Sometimes when you take already publicly available information and you have the public entity that is in charge of that information all of a sudden making it widely available on the internet right. I'm thinking of court documents it for does example. change things all, yeah, the, I mean, all, all of that is public all of but, this is you know, the same you, as you would see in the, in the court documents somebody somebody could you know start posting all of our household deeds yeah, somewhere online that's all public but if the county started doing it I don't know. But, but then, then I think there's a troubling line if you go back the other way. You say, okay, well, gee, we don't like this with the DWI because it could be anybody. Then where does that line end? And I argue that what's public is public. And if you wow. enable people not to put this stuff up, then at some point when the mayor is arrested for DUI. Yeah, you're right. And the mayor claims the same right. And the mayor says, no, 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 you can't release my name. Mm -hmm. We would all be screaming bloody murder. Mm -hmm. No, you're the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But you're there the you have the journalistic interest in the story that would pull that out and... Yeah, but if I'm a net in Montclair, New but, Jersey, the, it's, uh, any of my neighbors is of journalistic interest. <laughs> uh, no, no, of pr a prurient interest. The, the, the mayor is of true interest because oh, okay. he is to being held to a high, well, or she Norbert is being held down to... down the street. I've seen him running down the block. I'm glad they finally got Norby. Jesus, I saw him at the bar, and then he comes along, and finally, yeah. 
That's it's prurient. That's prurient. A mayor is an elected official. There's a higher standard. Or what about the 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 stories? I love this. We're in we're in law class now. Mm. Um, I, that's what. That's the only reason why you'd ever want to take law. You don't want to practice law. No, you just no, want no, to take no. law class forever, right? Um, yeah, law classes can be fun. <laughs> what about what about the, the towns that put up Johns as a way that's to discourage to that, people it? from being Johns? But those are convicted Johns. Not always. I think they're arrested. Uh -huh. I think they were arrested. They were up there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I've I never, understand the I've issues here. I've never seen here, a John that, on the internet. Here's an interesting <laughs> question from our chat room. Curtis B says, to ask you, Denise, if the, sus the, sus the suspect posted here could then sue for defamation if they're proven innocent afterwards. I don't think so. Because no. Because nothing about what the... All it said is they were arrested. They're arrested. They're a suspect. It's all true. They're you charged. Could, you could sue for a false arrest in certain cases. But it's all, were, but, but right. nothing on this page is untrue. Right. Nothing. There this is, doesn't do this. There is a species of, of defamation called false light. If you're portraying a person in a false light. Um, and this kind of comes close to that, but... But, I, you know, I think the police are covered here. They're not, I, other than under privacy kinds of considerations. Apparently if they do a bad have, arrest, they're liable yeah. in other ways. Right, 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 right. If this was not on Facebook, people would have no problem with this. It's because it's on Facebook. You're yeah. absolutely right, Jake. Or well, if it, the police department was posting it on its site. If they had a bulletin yeah. board, uh, it'd be the same. If they What's had a, a site? What's a site? We're going to get past sites. You go to where the yeah. people are. Yeah, what mm -hmm. does it mean? Yeah. Well, no, but let me ask you both. If Baristanet posted this for every person arrested in Montclair, New Jersey, would you have the same problem? Baristanet? That's a local blog, hyper-local oh, blog. okay. So no. That's, no? Right. <laughs> right? No. I guess not. No. It's because it's Facebook. You're right, Jake. Your, it's Facebook. It's way too public. Do you have a problem public. with the police department, Jake, doing this? No. I, mean, I have a problem have with the it. police like, department doing it on its own Facebook page. Why, though? I, because I think that they're taking on a journalistic role that actually winds up violating people's privacy expectations. Mm, interesting. I think it's because they're punishing them without due process. They're punishing mm -hmm. them before the trial yeah. by publicizing their information. It's like, well, you got arrested, so here's your punishment. Well, part of, part of the protection we have is that your trial is held in public. For the, for That's the accused true. as well. And part of the protection accused people have is that their jury pool is not tainted. So this is. A, oh, that's true too. Yeah, this is a. This might taint the jury pool. <laughs> <laughs> I love Leo's role in this. You know what's in, what, what I, Here's what I find very interesting. Which yeah, every, you're all right. I love you. <laughs> what I find very interesting is it is, and this is really what you are studying, and it always comes down to is our our notion of privacy in public has completely changed, yes. mm -hmm. and it's only because these tools, when things are public, they're public. And when they're private, you know, they're private. And, and these tools change. This, the Internet changes that. There's, there's yeah. a great discussion going on on my blog as I'm researching my book um, in which w one post, Sam Lesson, who started Drop.io, I Love think I mentioned Sam. this nice on, guy. on yeah. uh, This Week in Google, said that what's happened economically is that the price of privacy used to be free and publicness, publicity, cost you a lot. It, cost, it was very expensive to be a star. It's the exact opposite now. Yeah. Publicity is cheap and privacy is expensive. Uh -huh. That's true. Effort, That's right? true. And then David Weinberger came in and said we have a public privacy axis here. They're, they're not binary. It's not one or the other. But he said that, you know, in the old days, you were either Marilyn Monroe or you were a schmo, right? And now we are all, we all have a celebrity. We all deal with these issues. And it does change how we deal with having a public face because we all have one now. Mm -hmm. whether, whether even if we don't have our own Facebook page, we can be tagged. Right. On a Facebook page. So here's th another link from the chat room. Chicago Tribune. Mugs in the news. Hmm. A collection of Chicago area arrest photos. Arrest and booking photos are provided <laughs> by law enforcement officials. Arrest does not imply guilt and criminal charges are merely accusations. A defendant is presumed innocent unless presumed guilty. He doesn't look happy. But this is... But this is Maybe it may be voyeurism, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I know it's wrong. <laughs> it's way too it. interesting. Yep. All right, we're going to take another break. Jeff Jarvis, Jake Jarvis are here, Denise Howell as well. We're glad you're here as well we're talking about uh, legal stuff. But we got some, we got some more uh, tech news also. And I want to talk a little bit about the hot piece of meep. <laughs> the HPO. I'd never heard of that. Had you ever heard of that acronym? I never heard of that never, acronym. Never. No, not I think they made it up. Did you ever heard of it, Jake? Mm -hmm. Nope. Go ahead. No. <laughs> it's probably in the Urban Dictionary, but we're way too sophisticated to know about that. Before we do, I do want to mention our friends at Citrix. They do go to meeting that wonderful software that uh, you use to uh, save yourself from travel. See if Jeff and Denise had just used GoToMeeting. They could be nice and comfortable ensconced at home. 
Actually, go to meetings not so great for vacations, mm -hmm. but for business, yes. Yeah, save a lot of money. That may not be a bad idea. <laughs> go to meeting Disney World. That, that sounds good. And, and, and you know, <laughs> and that's interesting. And talk yeah. about virtual reality. Mm -hmm. You know, I imagine future versions of GoToMeeting. GoToMeeting 20, 2012 might have that feature. <laughs> Just put on the helmet and you're there. The whole idea of GoToMeeting is to take that boring conference call, unproductive conference call, and make it effective, make it visual, make it engaging. That's, uh, that's, that's just what's all, what it's all about. It's about saving you time and travel money. It's about uh, being engaged. Go to meeting keeps everybody on the same page during conference calls. Everybody on the call can see your screen. See what happens. You, you're on a conference call. You can do it on the fly. You just say, okay, everybody, go to gotomeeting.com right now. Here's the meeting ID. Now, suddenly, they're seeing your computer on their screen. You can show them the PowerPoint or the keynote presentation. Yes, Mac or PC. You could show them uh, spreadsheets. You, you can collaborate, too. You know, you can say, here, what do you think? What's wrong with this paragraph? And they can type. They can take control and show you what's on their computer as well. Up to 15 people at a time. Everyone on the call, more focused, more interested, more engaged. You're going to love it. For sales presentations, for product demos, for training, collaborating, Weekly update calls. We use it all the time here. We have several accounts. I want you to try it free for 30 days. Go to gotomeeting.com slash twit. G-O-T-O meeting dot com slash twit. 30 days free, unlimited use. Uh, you know, just give it a try. Show your colleagues, your clients. Show the boss. I think the boss will be impressed. Gotomeeting.com slash twit. We thank him so much for his support of uh, this week. In tech, Jeff Jarvis is here. The book, What Would Google Do? Do you have to rewrite it now a little bit? Now that you I'll Google? probably do, and I just talked to the publisher, I'll probably do a new forward for it. Hmm. What Google, what, what, did, what did Google do is what you have to call it. <laughs> what did Google do? Steve Avadnathian is trying to get his Googleization of everything, and I saw on Twitter this morning that he had to add in the uh, net neutrality fail, as he put it, into his book. <sighs> He's constantly changing his manuscript. He should have submitted it a long time ago. Now it's too late. He's going to have to change it every month. Google's doing so many different and interesting uh, things all the time. Did you see the announcement? I think we missed this. This, uh, this week in Google happened the morning of the announcement that they had these new hands-free commands. Jake, do you use an iPhone or a, iPhone. your iPhone? And Jeff, we made you use a Nexus One. <laughs> we made, oh, you got both. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Well, I confess I've got both with me, too, but, <laughs> but that's only because I, I want to see your stack of phones. Though. Yeah, there's quite a big stack. I got the bumper case. You know, this is the free bumper case. They said it wouldn't come till September. It came. Can't believe they're charging thirty bucks for this piece of plastic. Hard to believe. Anyway, it's uh, very sleek though. It's pretty. Mm -hmm. It's pretty. And and Apple bought Siri, which is a really cool application that lets you say things like "book me a restaurant," uh, "book me a dinner for two at uh, you know humble pie" or whatever. Um, but this new, I think the voice commands. Unfortunately, it's not in. It, you have to have two point two, so it's really only a few phones like the Droid Two or the Nexus One that can do it. But it's amazing. It you is. press a button. It's great. You could say note to self. It'll send you an email. What What do they say, Leo? I think it's like 25% of search queries on mobile are coming from voice command in these environments. That's amazing. Some huge number. I forget what it was. So this is one way of responding to, to the change in search is to, is, is our, you know, natural language, artificial intelligence, the ability easier. to talk to it and ask it for what you want. Yeah. Like, hey, send me directions to the nearest Starbucks. You actually can say... Uh, what is it? Directions to Starbucks, and it'll find the nearest Starbucks, and it'll, and it'll open Google Navigate, and it'll take you there. That's pretty cool. You can say, play uh, This Week in Tech, and it'll play the podcast. I think you say, listen to. Um, so that's very cool. And then they also unveiled, uh, we, we've been talking about it on uh, the show for a while, the Chrome to Phone feature where you can And now them. Phone to Chrome, both the, ways. Right. In the announcement, though, they said, that I think this is the most important bit, and it wasn't really uh, widely bruited, but they announced 200,000 activations a day now. 1.4 million phones a week. Uh, that's five, almost six million phones a month. They have now sold more Android phones than iPhones in the, the past year, and I'm sure they will eclipse iPhones soon. And we still have tons of devices coming out. Dell's just came out last week. The streak, yeah. Streak. Are you getting one, Leo? I should. It's AT and T, which really demotivates me. I hate will, to say will it. Will it work with a T-Mobile SIM or no? Uh, that's it's it's SIM locked, but uh, I'm sure somebody will come up with an unlock at some point. But right now, no. Mm. You're stuck with the uh, AT and T. The streak uh, is the slightly larger than an iPhone. Five inches. Smaller than an iPad. It's thing. not slightly larger. It's five <laughs> inches. It's, <laughs> it's it's the largest phone out there. But it looks mm -hmm. pretty dorky. I'm sure when you're holding this thing, this slab up to your head. <laughs> 
But I think that that, you know, we were talking about this on This Week in Google. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Denise, that looks good. She's, talk, she's talking to her iPad. We were talking about This Week in Google. That's the difference between Apple and Google. Apple, you know, Steve Jobs probably at some point there was a table with all different size screens for the iPhone. You know, everywhere from two inches to ten inches. And Steve goes, mm, that one. And that's it. And as you said, Jeff, in the difference is there's still a table with all different sizes, but we get to say, uh, that one. Right. Well, it's the same mm -hmm. thing with Mac computers and Windows computers. That's true. But you use a Mac, don't you? Uh, yeah, he's yeah. Admit the yeah, truth. He's, yeah, he's, got a, <laughs> he's got a Mac right there. And an iPhone. <laughs> I think it's a little different in phones. I, I, you know, I love Macs, and I think that Macs are much more open than phones, though. I think oh, the yeah, iPhone is so okay. closed. Yeah. You can make a pretty strong case for the choice uh, in the Android phone. So... What is obviously is happening is that the balance of power is shifting. Android phones now are going to be... What I'm curious about, and you're a developer, Jake, I'd be curious what you say about this. I wonder how long before developers start saying, okay, we're going to develop for the Android platform first, and then if we've got any resources left, we'll do an iPhone version. How long before that happens? I don't know. It's very different. I mean, you have to almost completely make two different apps. Well, it's so, true. I mean, Windows, Mac, same thing. Right, exactly. So it's, I liken it to that, and I think what's mm -hmm. happening is you're seeing maybe you know maybe you might say aesthetically Android's not as good as a lot yeah, of Mac. I think Mac. that's what people are waiting for. For it to be as good. Yeah, just ease of use and all. You can't find an ugly iPhone app, I think. Well, that's odd because people who buy phones are buy are it's outselling Apple phones like two well, to one now. It's on three all the to one. And you can get well, it doesn't matter. More people are buying it. Hasn't the market well, spoken? If you're locked into Verizon, then you have to buy an Android phone. Uh, I've heard this argument now. everywhere on the internet. It, it's, it's, it's merely because they're, they're, they're... So you're saying Android's selling so many phones only because people aren't so on AT&T. Yeah. iPhone is one phone. Do you buy that? I think I, think I do, yeah. That um, you have to make an affirmative effort to go out and get an iPhone. But if right. you're just picking up a phone... It may be an Android phone because that's just what you I'll got. I'll tell you, I, if I'm a developer, I don't care why. I'm just okay. looking at 200,000 phones yeah. a day. That's a new market. That's a big market, and it's growing fast, and I think it's obviously permanently outpaced the iPhone. Do you think? Can yeah. Apple come back? What if Apple yeah. goes on Verizon in January? Does that change it? I think, yeah, I think so. That's I saw the, a stat that's, that 35% of AT&T Apple users are waiting to go on Verizon. Yeah. Now, you say that, who knows? When I'm waiting. To pay the, and uh, all the Verizon users who are waiting to get an iPhone. That will be the test of your assertion. Because if it's suddenly available on Verizon, and then it says, oh, now we're going to sell 150000 right. more, then okay, maybe. Plus, it's more expensive, though. You have to factor that in. It's the same. 200 bucks. Monthly well, fee's free, pretty close. They'll be free Android phones. Mm -hmm. I think there, I'm sure there are. Oh, you mean the iPhone's more expensive? Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 right. But oh, Jake, yeah. Don't you also have more risk with the iPhone that you go to all this effort, you make the app, and then Steve says, no. Sure. Right? Yeah. That's to me the risk. I, I, you know, I tried to get uh, Lisa Betney to come on, and she says, we're not allowed to speak. <laughs> at all. <laughs> at all. Mm -hmm. But Lisa it, it worked with a company called Tap, Tap, Tap to make, she's a photographer, been on Twit many times, she's a great person to make an application uh, called Cam Plus. This is a very cool application. Um, the, it, I have it right here, on, uh, in fact, on my iPhone. Um, so you, you use it to you know, f retouch photos, to create different styles. It's a, it's a nice application. So they released an update to the uh, Apple Store that turned the volume switch on the iPhone into a camera button. This is actually something pretty cool on a lot of Android phones. You have, or a lot of phones in general, you have a camera button. Not on the iPhone, it's a soft button. You have to press it. And Apple said, no. Read, very, look here, see the fine print. It says, in the developer's agreement, you, thou may not, thou shalt not modify the functionality of the volume buttons. Not allowed. So they did not allow that app to come the out. The app was still in the App Store at that point. This was an update to the app. Right, but then the next revision, they hid the feature. So what happened is, exactly, they didn't. it was already in there. Yep. They posted a tweet, which was immediately redacted, <laughs> but too late, the internet, <laughs> everything lives forever. They posted a tweet that said, well, you know, it is a funny thing. If you uh, go to Safari and you enter uh, Cam Plus, Cam, what was it, Camera Phone, Cam Phone Plus, sl like colon, slash, slash, enable uh, shutter button, I'll, I'll get the actual URL for you. You can Google it. It's easy to find. Oh, lo and behold, the original app, it turns it on. I've got it right now. Here, watch. It's really cool. I'll take a picture. <laughs> so Apple 
Oh, I just took a picture of me. That's not good. Of course it is. Apple uh, said, whoa, and they pulled the, pulled the app off. Well, we don't know. See, look, it just it snaps it just like that when I press this button. And this is a very nice feature, but it Apple's is. very clear that you're not allowed to do that. I understand why Apple said that because it's confusing, right? They Their position, this is always Apple's kind of <laughs> aesthetic, mm -hmm. is no, a button does one thing and one thing only. <laughs> if you make this button have two functions, people will be confused and we don't want confusion to reign in the land of Apple. Do we? It's like the mouse. Yeah, it's the mouse. It's the one button mouse. <laughs> so the nice thing on a, on a Mac, you could just buy a new mouse, but you better not do that on the iPhone because we'll pull your app from the App Store. Now, I tried to get Lisa to tell me whether it was, and this is, there's still a little question, was it Apple that pulled it? These guys at Tap, Tap, Tap are great marketers. It could very well be that they pulled it <laughs> to get the attention that they're getting right now. What's so the same with that, that flashlight app a few weeks ago that if you pressed a certain configuration of colors, it turned the tethering on. Turned on tethering. Yeah. Apple pulled that one, too. Well, obviously, yeah. But this one's a little more innocent. A couple of things that are embarrassing for Apple in that. First of all, their vetting process isn't and couldn't be perfect. So if you can do that, you could probably put right. malware out there, spyware out there. It's completely possible because you're not giving the source code to Apple mm -hmm. to bury stuff in an application. That's obvious now. So it's a little embarrassing to Apple. But also this issue. Now, is Apple in the wrong in yanking this? Let's say, let's assume. I don't know if Tap 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 did it. I'm going to assume Apple yanked it. Is Apple wrong in yanking the app? Well, in their eyes, this app is the same thing as a tethering app. They're hiding a feature that Apple told them not to do. That's right. against their terms They violated service. the terms of service. So I guess technically, legally, yeah. But, but I'm, I understand they have the right to do it. Were they wrong to do it? Uh, they weren't wrong the second time to reject the app because it was a hidden feature. But They're the first pissed. time, I think they should give their users a little more credit. Right. Like all iPhone users are not stupid. They can understand that when the camera app is open, the volume buttons do not change the volume. And as Just My Two Cents is saying in our chat room, look, if you were smart enough to find this cam plus colon slash slash URL right. and enter it in, presumably you're smart enough to know that you did it on purpose <laughs> and that the volume buttons are changing their functionality only in this context. So you, it seems to me that Apple could reasonably say, all right, well, go ahead. And if, if, if in the other company we'd say, hey, listen to your customers, they want this button. But, of course, Apple doesn't listen. So. No. So that's my point. Yeah. I guess that's just my point. And, and uh, Tap, Tap, Tap. Now, it's interesting because Tap, Tap, Tap says, and I believe them, they've sold half a million dollars worth of this application, which means Apple got 30% of that, <laughs> $150,000 in their pocket. Uh, and so they're willing to turn, turn, turn their back on quite a bit of money. I mean, what, would, what would you say if Samsung did this? Or BlackBerry I, I think this? they'd yank it. I don't think Apple cares. I think Apple is b believes, and I think probably rightly so, they're the keeper of the flame. And if you're choosing the Apple platform, you're choosing that point of view, aren't you? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, definitely. Denise, anything to say? No, I agree. She's yeah. fondling her Long iPhone. I'm watching the chat on my iPhone. <laughs> oh, okay. We could get you. Can't you see it on there? You on your iPad? Uh, well, there's there's kind of a multitasking issue with that because oh, I want to look at the story oh, links that. and stuff. Oh, you can't multitask. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Yes. So two devices do the job. Uh, Seinfeld says he saw a study that found Apple users are more anxious about computers <laughs> than other than Windows users. So maybe Apple's just rightly saying, "Well, we don't want to create any anxiety." Another story from Apple, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, an Apple employee, a mid-level, not a, not a high-level, mid-level Apple employee was arrested on Friday for receiving $1 million in kickbacks from six suppliers to Apple, six companies in Asia that supply to Apple. By the way, they published his name, so I, <laughs> I guess <laughs> accused, alleged, charged. He was indicted by the federal grand jury for uh, wire fraud, money laundering, unlawful monetary transactions, and... Uh, I'm surprised that Apple doesn't have controls, 10 layers of controls, such that, that would be impossible. Well, they caught him. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And he only got a million dollars. It's going to be a very expensive million dollars. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Apple said it began investigating him for a possible violation of corporate follow policies, found a cache of suspicious emails from his personal Hotmail and Gmail account on his company's laptop, and they, boy, he got him red-handed. This would be one of our tips of the week on Twill where we tell people, don't do this. <laughs> just don't do this. Well, it, but, yeah, just don't do it on the, well, either don't do it or don't do it on the company laptop. <laughs> that might be the better advice. Yes. 
Mark Hurd probably could tell him a little bit about that. Yes. Do you have any opinions about that? About Hurd? You know, it's interesting because uh, I, I talked to Paul Therod, who does our Windows show, who was a big fan of Hurd's. You know, Hurd came in and rescued HP. Carly Fiorina had pretty much dug a deep ditch for HP with a compact merger right. and a bunch of other things. And Mark Hurd came in, turned the company around, laid a lot of people off. In fact, I saw his approval rating among HP employees was down like 34%. Um, nevertheless, he's, he's made the company very successful, very profitable. I think it's a, the acquisition of Palm is very intriguing and perhaps a very good idea. That was clearly his idea. He really championed that. Um, and, of course, he, he was fired. Paul thinks it's because HP is just basically kind of an old-fashioned company. He was fired because allegedly... <laughs> <laughs> reputedly, reportedly. Reputedly. Well, there is some debate about this, actually. Allegedly, he fudged his expense accounts, not even for very much money, some say, just a, f a few tens of thousands of dollars, to wine and dine a lovely uh, young lady who happened to be an HP uh, contractor uh, and put travel and so forth on his company expense report. And HP said, well, you can't do that violation. She had sued him for sexual harassment. It's not clear whether he was fired for harassment. No, or he wasn't. For, the, he the, wasn't. The, he was the investigation found no problem there. But in the process of that, I understand. They found this, uh, you know, illegitimate, allegedly illegitimate. Well, maybe that uh, was like Al Capone's uh, uh, violation of the tax code. It was right. just a way mm -hmm. to bust him. Well, but then the person who filed the complaint put a statement out. She was, she was very sorry that he lost his job. He should have lost his job. And they settled. And they settled personally. HP didn't settle with her. Oh, interesting. Yeah. He resigned, didn't he? He wasn't fired. He was, he was going forced to, be, to. I'm sure he yeah. was forced to resign, yeah, by the board. Um, so it's an Larry interesting. Ellison, I think, then complained to the board and publicly the New York Times. Well, there's even some lawsuits now. There's now the lawsuits about it. You, know, you wonder whether we've gotten too um, persnickety. Paul's opinion was, I don't know if you agree with this, that it's just that HP is kind of an old-fashioned company. They're, you know, they, they're not uh, a modern tech company that, you know, had it been Google or another company, it might not have gone down. Wasn't it HP that was uh, bugging reporters? Yes. That? Well, that's another so story. Over the but that was under Carly sensitive. Fiorina, wasn't yes. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The... Uh, what do they call that when they they, fa they pretend to be somebody else? There's a name for it. Oh, yeah. Yes. And I'm blanking on it, too. It. Uh, but you know the chat room will know. Yeah. They Pretexting. Do. Pretexting. How there fast is that? Who needs a brain when you have a chat room? No, the chat room is my brain. Thank you, Brian and W. Pretexting, where they pretend Thank to goodness. be somebody else. Let's talk about uh, Jenny in just a little bit. But first. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny. Jenny. What's Jenny's number? Everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Eight, six, seven, five. Uh, I want to mention uh, a brand new sponsor on the show. We're really glad to have them. They actually, uh, um, it's General Electric. And uh, they we're doing a, a Green Tech show, and we're really happy to have General Electric as part of our uh, partnership to make the Green Tech show possible. GE has uh, something they call the $200 million Eco Imagination Challenge. They are giving, I think this is so cool, GE and its partners are giving... $200 million out to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. So if you go to ecoimagination.com slash challenge, you can find out more about this. They're making investments in three energy categories. The first is renewables. Uh, they're looking for better ways to integrate renewable en energy into the power grid. Of course, you know, sun, solar, uh, wind, uh, water. I was just on the Vanderbilt estate in Upper New York State. Um, this is a Gilded Age estate. It's beautiful, so gorgeous, beautiful house. They, it, this is they built it in uh, 1898. They were the first home to have bathrooms. You know, not outhouses, but bathrooms with running water. But they had they put a a a, pa a water power station on the creek. This is at the turn of the century, mm. and the house had electricity wow. from the from the creek. It was like, this was like a state-of-the-art house. Not only do we have toilets, <laughs> we have lights. So we're getting back to the old ideas, I guess. The second uh, category, grid efficiency. They want to convert the smart grid to digital energy. This is, that's the new name, the new term people are starting to use for smart grid. To improve transparency at every step of the grid, from power generation to consumption, to reduce waste, and to give consumers and energy service providers better choice do you ever think that you could choose your electricity, where it comes from? Push a button. Their third investment category is eco homes and buildings. GE says energy consumption is growing so quickly, it's creating an imbalance between demand and supply. We know that. That's obvious. 
That's leading to higher energy costs, of course, for everybody, consumers and business. So they want to change how and when we use energy to lower energy costs. So you can enter this, believe it or not. If you enter GE's Eco Imagination Challenge, you'll have the opportunity to develop a commercial relationship with GE. We're looking for entrepreneurs, business types, tech types, smart people. GE will help you scale the concept quickly with their sales and distribution infrastructure, accelerate development. They've got a lot of technical people that can help you. And even secure investment, either from GE or their partner VC firms in Silicon Valley. $200 million in this. This is great. Go to ecoimagination.com slash challenge to learn more, submit your ideas, and enter the challenge. You can review. And this actually, everybody, even if you're not an entrepreneur or an inventor, I want you to go there because you get to look at, I'm going to pull this up, the, uh, and review the, uh, the ideas already submitted. Just click participate in the challenge. So anybody can get involved. It's ecoimagination.com slash challenge. They announced this uh, the other day um, in San Francisco, actually. And I was going to head out there. And we, I think we were out of town. Oh, dear. I hope that's not the case. Ecoimagination. Ecoimagination. Did I spell it wrong? Ecoimagination. No I. Okay, so I have my entry. There it is. It's coming up. Mm -hmm. Yes, eco imagination. No, I. I'm sorry. I said it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have my entry. Yes. So down the road from here, there is a house that has a uh, metal sculpture slash windmill on top of it that's made out of Isn't half cool? barrels. Yes. And I see that house every day as I right go by. Yeah. The 101 freeway. Yep. We plant one on top of the Twit Cottage, and it powers everything in here. We've actually really been interested in figuring out a way to make this uh, green and solar or whatever. One of the things that we use very these are all LED lights and mm -hmm. um, and compact fluorescent lights, so we use very little, surprisingly little power. This is a antique home it, we we couldn't power real lights in here so we, we try to do the best you know what's can. great about the the ge thing i'm not paid to say this you are so it's okay i can say yeah, it you can say <laughs> it <I'm> um <laughs> is is that you know i think it's where we need to go in, in all kinds of ways and and it wasn't that long ago when companies would say no no no, no don't send us our ideas because we're going to be liable if we open up right. an envelope and and we don't want to hear any ideas and this is the way the world has to go. And the fact that they're going to invest a large amount of money in entrepreneurship and new ideas is where it, it's a capitalistic thing I'm starting a, an investment fund at CUNY where I teach journalism. Are you? New business models for news. That's great. Once I get some, a lot of lawyers to do a lot of pro bono work to figure out all the details of how mm -hmm. to do that. But, uh, but I think that that's what we have to do in industry after industry is we've got to invest in entrepreneurship and new ideas. And so doing this and advertising it to a geek entrepreneurial technology audience, I think is very smart. That's a great idea. They've got a Google map uh, mashup here of uh, where these ideas are coming from. 42 so far from Canada, 657 from the U.S., 12 from Mexico. They're from all over the world. Algeria, Greece, Oman, Kenya, Singapore, India, Australia, the Philippines. It's really cool. 1,107 ideas submitted so far. You can vote. 15,000 votes registered, 10,000 comments, 10,000 users. Join the Eco Imagination Challenge, E-C-O-M-A-G-I-N-A-T-I-O-N.com slash challenge. We do thank GE for supporting uh, the Twit Network and for uh, advertising on our new Green Tech show. We really are having fun with that show. and you can... Which is also a good idea for a show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've wanted to do it for a while. And Sarah Lane and uh, Dr. K uh, Kirsten Sanford, our science uh, reporter, do the show. You can listen to it if, or watch it if you go to twit.tv slash GTT Green Tech Today. And, um, and really having, having a partner like GE really made it possible because it's an expensive show. It's pretty. So, did you, who here fell for Jenny? And I meant uh, fell for the story. Both, well, both ways. I, she's yeah. kind of cute. <laughs> she was pretty cute, yeah. I admit it. I, I saw it on, you know, and, and this is the thing. You should know when you see something on the chive.com, you should think twice, right? They've done it before. But we kind of wanted to fall for it. I wanted to believe it. That's what was interesting in this case. Even when we knew most, when, when the first word came out, I said, whoa, guys, this is probably a hoax. We said, okay, so, so what? We're going to enjoy this anyway. So, Jake, now, come on. You're the young guy. Did you yeah. fall for it? I did, yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> fell for it. So, uh, tell us a story. Who is Jenny? I don't know much about it, but apparently it's this girl that quit her job. Or supposedly. Supposedly quit her job. And, and used, quit it very publicly. Yeah, and used 30 pictures of her writing on this whiteboard to do it. She says, I quit. I've learned a lot these past two years. And, she's, you know, she's got glasses. It's pretty credible, right? 
It looks real. Great and expressions. I'm, and I'm all going to miss you. She's a yeah. boy, yeah. she an actress. Uh -huh. She says, except, I'm going to miss you all except one. I'm looking at you, Spencer. Being your assistant has been a special hell. <laughs> I put up with your temper and your bad breath. You know why this resonates? Everybody's wanted to write these, right? Yeah, yes, hopefully she'll cats. inspire someone. Yeah. On Friday, I yeah. transferred you a call. I was about to hang up when I heard you call me a Hopa. Hopa? Hopa? And then she defines Hopa as hot piece of beep. They had a little spelling error there. <laughs> hot there was tweet. a big discussion about yes. that on the internet. People said, uh, you're being too literal. <laughs> That's, how, I guess, how it's said. Ah. See, she said H-O-P-A, but it's really H-P-O-A. Yeah. It's interesting. You'd think in a hoax you would spell it right. <laughs> Is that really all you thought of me? Oh, look how sad she looks there. <laughs> Did you ever wonder why everybody in the office called the trash a garbage dispenser? That's a little off. That a little, was a little, yeah. That's, uh, probably that, have that. that should have been a red flag. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little Steve Carell. too convenient. Yeah. Office morale is down since you installed the little office snitch so you could monitor how we spend our time. This, I believe. So I wondered, how does Spencer spend his time online? You gave me the codes, after all, four hours a week on Scott Trade. It's supposed to be a brokerage, right? So that's his real job. Mm -hmm. th three hours a week on TechCrunch. Incidentally... There's the giveaway. That was, that was brilliant. <laughs> this is the giveaway. <laughs> you knew they'd fall for it. They fell for it. Uh -huh. So the little plug for TechCrunch. Yeah. This is where the Resig brothers showed they know what they're doing. <laughs> and now, if that had said, if that had said five point three hours on Twitch, I would have fallen for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they missed a boat on that one. And drum roll. 190, no, I'm sorry, 19.7 <laughs> hours a week playing Farmville. This, by the way, if you think about it, half his work day playing Farmville, it's yeah. not that compelling. Yeah. Even I, who was addicted to Farmville, never, I don't think. Maybe I you did. You need one big herd. <laughs> if I get a message like this from Lisa. I'm gonna... <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this Hopa, now, by the way, this is when I, this is when I um, started to get a little suspicious. She moves the whiteboard out of the way to show off what a... Opa, she is. She also changes clothes. And suddenly, she goes from her blue tank <laughs> top to a white tank top, throws away the glasses, and she's wearing short shorts. So this Hopa is moving on. Although, and by the way, again, this is clearly calculated, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. obvious why we fell for this. I don't know. Although I don't have another job, something tells me I'll be just fine. So I saw this. I, I came really close, but I didn't to forwarding it to somebody and saying, oh, isn't this funny? Mm -hmm. Didn't. And I thank God I didn't because Jenny has been revealed to be an actress. Elise Porterfield. Yeah, in fact, there's a video now on the website from uh, Jenny. Oh. Yeah. They really, they, this is quite brilliantly done. These guys, these brothers have done this before a couple of times, right? Mm -hmm. What's great is they auditioned multiple actresses for this role. Mm -hmm. They wanted a girl next door. Yeah. Yeah, they, they got her. Well, and they, they hit on something that's a theme of your book, that anybody could do this. Yes. <laughs> Watch out, Spencers of the world. Yes. Yeah. This People is probably the, will. This is the key oh, yeah. to virality, though, is you need to tap into a commonly held emotion, preferably several, humor, mm -hmm. pathos, anger. Right. Tim Street told me this, and I think he's absolutely right. Mm. This is the key. Uh, she does have a Twitter. Of course, she has a Twitter account. She is official Elise E L L Y S. -E. Her, her, her page is nothing much. And it's John and Leo Resig at thechive.com. What was their other? Uh, they did a, a Trump uh, $100,000. It was it a $1,000 tip or some, some outrageous number for a tip? Oh, yeah. Mm. Donald Trump had a, uh, had a, had a, um, a, he tipped, yeah, a huge amount on a $20 bill. Um, he'd done this twice. Now, credit goes to Peter Kafka. He writes the media memo. I think it was he who discovered this. I think he was this. the first one to say, just simply say, whoa, <laughs> come on. Yeah, bro. this is incredible. We like it. We know you want to believe it, but. And he did a good job. He, he tracked down the chive.com and who owned it. He said, oh, yeah, it's the Resigs. Before that, they ran a site called D-Rober, which features doctored photos of celebrities in their underwear. <laughs> <laughs> And it was at DeRober where in December 2007 where they had the story about Donald Trump leaving a $10,000 tip on an $82 bill. Fox News and The Post ran that story. 
So uh, Peter called him. He said, uh, he calls Leo Resig. He says, uh, Jenny's a fake, right? Resig says, Jenny's very real. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. I love the way they handled it. Yeah. <laughs> um, he says, Jenny's with his brother John at this very moment. The three of them are trying to figure out the best way to identify her and tell her story. Jay Leno wants her on the show. Good Morning America wants her on the show. He says, we're not sure how to proceed. We want to be respectful of the girl. Um, now, Peter doesn't give up. He's a good reporter. I have yeah, to say, he, he really handled this well. He says, okay, but you're the same guys who gave us the Donald Trump story. That was fake, right? Is this one different? Pause. Good homework. That was a good time. Oh, so this is, so this Jenny story is real then. This one is to be determined. People are kind of making up their own stories. In other words, they hedge mm. and they hedge. Finally, he says, since uh, Leo won't tell me the story is real and the Trump story definitely wasn't, I'll assume this one is make-believe too. Quote, well, if you want to assume that, you can. We have a track record. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. They claim the Chive, the Berry, the Brigade, and the Throttle, their four sites, have a monthly audience of 5.6 million uniques. The Chive has 1.3 million uniques, according to Comscore. Have you heard of the Chive before? I never heard of you? it before. No, I have now. I think that well, probably was they, they <laughs> what was they were yep, after. Yep. The Onion should buy them. Yeah. Yeah. What's the, it's, I don't know if it's Onion-like or, or what, but it's... it's um, Sounds like it. Yeah. And, of course, what we love about the other... There's the secondary story that everybody fell for it. Including TechCrunch, which ran the story, and then... Who like, should hire a lease, by the way? Mm -hmm. TechCrunch should. They should. They that should. would be smart. They need somebody for TechCrunch TV. I think they that do. would be exactly the right person to hire. <laughs> oh, Mike? do it, Leo. Huh? You Maybe I should hire her. Yeah. No, I can't afford her. I can tell you right now, she's <laughs> way out of my league. <laughs> TechCrunch also ran the story uncovering Elise's identity. So, right. to their credit, they, they, they had both sides of this story. Oh, I get it. The chive, it's the like onion. the onion. Yes. Oh. I get it. Thank you, chat room. Apparently, they're on FARC a lot. So if I were a FARC follower, I would have Ah, known. okay. Well. The chive. But now we know HOPA. Pronounced HOPA, but spelled H-P-O-A. We now know what that uh, means. Chat room, had anyone ever heard that before, or was that made up too? That's what I think it's made up. Me. I'd never heard anyone described. All right, if HOPA. anybody's heard of it, the chat no. room. Chat room, mm -hmm. anybody? Before this? HOPA. It's, uh, now, the JetBlue guy's real, though, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Apparently, okay. the story is not all as true as people really. Think. There's really? more to the it. Sliding down oh, the oh, that part's slide? real, but people are saying that he didn't get hit in the head and stuff. Oh, really? Oh, he made yeah. up the thing about the lady swearing and all that. Most of my um, chatters say they've never heard of Hopa. See, I think that's the other part of the story. I think they even made up that, which is good. They made up an great. acronym, mm -hmm. and wow. the kind of twisting it around probably makes it more legitimate. I think. But all right. Well, I think we've gone through all of the possible stories that we could possibly milk. <laughs> and uh, I'm really glad you guys were here. It was a well, lot of fun. It's, I tell you, folks, it's wonderful to be in the cottage. This is our first time here. And I didn't even see if you had any booze or anything. Yeah, well, somebody's been in my Balvenie, though. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. The 3D Leo is a great thing to, uh, to behold. Yes, yes, I've got a rear. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> barely, though. Becky Worley says, I suffer from male pattern ass loss. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> oh. I know, that's mean. <laughs> Jeff Jarvis is, uh, of course, at buzzmachine.com, which is a must-read blog where he covers stories like these and many more. Uh, in, I think re I've always enjoyed reading it. I really like the, the long-form take you do on these things. I know it probably doesn't seem like long-form to you as a real <laughs> mm -hmm. journalist, but for a blog, it's long-form. What are you, a thousand words usually? Or? Yeah, about that, yeah. Yeah. You know, depends on how mad I get. <laughs> I love it. It's a column. Most recently, yeah. Internet <laughs> Schmitternet. That's the one uh, where he talks about the Google Verizon deal. His book, What Would Google Do, is available in bookstores everywhere. Look for the new one, Public Parts. He's working on it right now, even as we speak. Is Howard and Stern going to blurb it for you? That'd be nice. Mm -hmm. That'd be nice. He's in it already. Yeah. Oh, good. It's a play on Howard's it's, book. It's an Private right. Parts, obviously, right. yeah. And you're going to be at the uh, I. IIP PII 2010 Seattle in Seattle Talking about privacy and public next week yep. next week Jake will be in college yep. congratulations Yay. thank you working hard studying hard uh -huh. at where again University of Rochester University of Rochester up the road a piece from That's Abby right. I'll have to get yep. you two together yeah. what's the mascot uh 
Bumblebee or ye Yellow Jacket? Yeah, it's <laughs> you better get that right. <laughs> well, it's not used very much. You better get that. They, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same with Abby's school. It's like yeah. mm, I don't even know if they have. They must have a mascot, but I don't. I'm sure. Well, the chess team. The chess team, exactly. <laughs> Jake, thanks for being here. JakeJarvis.com. And, of course, it's so nice to have Denise Howell in the studio. We very, very rarely get to see her. She is usually at home where she hosts This Week in Law every Friday at 11, 11 a.m. Pacific, mm -hmm. yes. 2 p.m. Eastern Time on live.twit.tv. Her blog is bagandbaggage.com, but she also writes the Logarithms blog. L-A-G-L-A-W-G. -L -A -G. Get it? Law. Log Law. Logarithms yes. blog on the ZDNet. Thank you all for being here. This show uh, is live every Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC at live.twit.tv. We do everything, almost everything we do on Twit is available live on the live.twit.tv channel and then packaged up for your consumption later should you want to listen after the fact. You can go to the website twit.tv to find the shows. We do a daily, if you like tech news, a daily, wonderful daily tech news show with Tom Merritt, formerly of CNET Buzz Out Loud. He does... Uh, Tech News Today with Becky Worley and uh, Sarah Lane and um, Hack 5's Darren Kitchen, a lot of great people. That's every Monday through Friday at live.twit.tv. Uh, the show pre-show begins at uh, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern Time. And, uh, of course, you can always chat in our chat room. That's 24-7 now, irc.twit.tv. Thank you for joining us. Anything else I should plug? Anybody this else can Google. Plug? This week in Google. Oh, that's right. Jeff uh, mm -hmm. and I do yep. with Gina, the wonderful Gina wonderful. Trapani, uh, This Week in Google, all about Google. And uh, this week, I think we're going to try to get a Googler on, at least Kevin Marks, an ex-Googler, and if not Chris DeBona as well on, on, uh, on Wednesday. We do that show at 1 p.m., right? 1 yes. p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. I'll be watching. That'll be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. And I love This Week in Law. It, I've always, I always wanted to do the show because we talk about legal issues so often with so little regard for the actual truth. It's nice to have real lawyers talking about it. For, for What's great about the Internet and the whole Twit Network is you can do a whole show in the law, mm -hmm. which you yes. couldn't have done in the old world. Well, yeah. you know, for me, this whole thing is in reaction to mainstream media, which I labored in the you know vineyards of six-minute segments for 20 years. And so it's so nice to say, that's why this show's so long, because I just can't stop. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I love the opportunity to surface people like Corinne McSherry from EFF, who was on our last show. Oh, she's great. We get wonderful law professors to come join us. And, you know, you just don't get access to these people in your daily life. So it's nice for us. Nice yeah, for really you, I hope. Is. It's really great. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jake. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next time. Another this Twit is, is in the can. Oh, I forgot to play the video, the Fiesta video. Darn nation. We had a guy. I should find it. It's pretty funny. The guy sent us a, an email, a YouTube video. Hi, Leo. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your great Ford commercials. And uh, one of the reasons is, is uh, basically I purchased a new 2011 Ford Fiesta. Uh, one of the reasons was is you keep on talking about that wonderful Ford Sync. And... Uh, I was waiting for the day when a car would come out that is a car that I wanted from Ford that would have the Ford Sync. And uh, so I bought one, the 2011 Ford Fiesta. I bought a Magenta, actually the same car that you had with the, uh, with the Ford Flex. And uh, it was exactly the same. And uh, I just hope it wasn't that car. Firewall.